panel on technology on technology and labor markets. So let me just quickly share my screen. Um, actually, sorry, I'm not, I'm not able to share my screen. I just have a very quick introduction I wanted to run through. So in the meantime, um, my name is Victoria Shachenko. I'm an assistant professor at INSEAD. And it is my utmost pleasure to welcome our distinguished group of panelists today. Um, that span both academia and industry and are really at the cutting edge of helping us understand how does technology impact labor markets and what does that mean for the UN sustainability goals. So please welcome Davor Miskelin, the head of international business development at EMSI Burning Glass, Peter Nolander, associate professor at the Quinlan School of Business, Prasanna Tambe, associate professor at the Wharton School, James White, founder of Unit of Work, and Lin Wu, Associate Professor at the Wharton School. So thank you so much for your time and for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, but before I pass the floor on to our panelists, I wanted to take this opportunity to quickly run through a very brief introduction to what this webinar will be about and also kind of lay out the main themes that we're going to be covering. So what is the role of technology in labor markets? And of course, as we all know, the A sustainability goal suggests that states that we should aim to promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full of productive employment and decent work for all. However, in recent decades, of course, we've seen the cost of computing falling dramatically and growing digitalization and automation that have enabled information and communication technologies to emerge, robotics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so forth, that are posing important challenges to achieving this goal, specifically in changing the demand for skills that companies are experiencing, disrupting the production processes that they use, and introducing new types of employment relationships that are reshaping how workers relate to organizations and one another. And a lot of these changes have also been further accelerated as a result of the ongoing pandemic that has seen widespread digitalization and automation, of many tasks that have been performed by humans up until now. So why are these challenges important and why are we discussing this? And I think really at the core is this constant ongoing tension between on the one hand, the classical theories that we have in early evidence on economic growth and past technological progress that suggests that at least in the long run, a lot of technologies have actually tended to increase labor productivity, leading to higher demand for labor, higher wages and higher standards of living, sort of lifting more or less most boats, at least in a sort of medium to long run. But more recent evidence is actually starting to paint a much more nuanced picture where technologies can have both positive and negative impacts on labor productivity and wages, depending on features such as the nature of the technology, workers' existing skills, and their ability to acquire these new skills, their ability to move across organizations and geographies, and also the institutions governing these employment relationships. Moreover, what we're increasingly seeing is that these impacts are not necessarily equally spread across geographies and countries. So a recent World Development Report has this nice graph where essentially on the x-axis is the expected labor market disruption that countries are facing that's combining both the impacts of communication technologies and automation. And on the y-axis, what you see is the predicted adaptability of countries to these changes, essentially quality adjusted years of education. And what you see first is, of course, the wide dispersion of countries in terms of what are the likely expected market disruptions they're going to face and their ability to adapt. But also importantly, sort of this bottom right-hand quadrant where you have a number of countries that are expected to face significant disruptions and maybe not be able to adapt to them as successfully. And of course, the important question is how do we help these, these um, countries adapt better and what can we do in thinking about the types of technologies that we need to, um, that we need to develop? So what are we gonna discuss in this webinar specifically? We're going to focus on essentially three broad themes. The first theme being the impacts of these quote unquote new technologies, of course, not all of them are entirely new, but their impacts on labor productivity have been um, somewhat novel in recent years. And here it helps to distinguish between sort of three broad groups of workers, workers who use these new technologies day to day. And for them, a lot of these technologies can be productivity enhancing in some of the tasks they're already performing, substituting away some other tasks, and generate, generating entirely new tasks that are redefining the types of jobs these workers perform. The second important group of workers are those who are actually at the forefront developing these technologies. For them, there's also the additional burden of actually trying to keep up with these technologies and be able to innovate on top of them. And finally, there's a very big and important group of workers who are neither developing nor using these technologies day to day, but who depend very heavily on the productivity spillovers that are generated by the first two groups of workers 
And these workers both depend on them due to providing goods and services to these first two groups, but also being co-located with them. And so I'm going to explore what is the likely aggregate impact on labor productivity based on these sort of definitions of different types of workers. The second broad theme that we're going to explore is the role that these technologies also have on the way organizations are designed in terms of how are tasks assigned across workers and how are jobs defined? What are the changes that we're seeing in organizational hierarchies and decision rates? And how are occupational jurisdictions evolving? Which occupations are taking over which sorts of tasks and how does that actually impact in the end wages and productivity of workers? And the final broad theme that we're going to look at are the impacts of these new technologies directly on the bargaining power of workers. And there's sort of a few effects, both through greater access to information about jobs and working conditions in other organizations, also direct effects of communication technologies aiding labor organizations across firms and geographies in helping workers organize, and software to also provide training for workers on collective bargaining. So together, what these themes are going to try to enable us to at least begin to brainstorm answers to are questions such as what are the likely aggregate impacts of these new technologies on labor demand and wages? What types of skills will workers need to succeed in the labor market over the next decade? How are these skills best acquired and who should be paying for their acquisition? And finally, and importantly, what are the types of institutions that we need to think about in order to govern these processes? So I don't wanna to take too much time on this intro and I wanna pass the floor on to our, our presenters and panelists. So what I wanna do in terms of the agenda for the webinar today is we're gonna spend the first hour, maybe hour and 10 minutes on presentations by our panelists. And specifically we're going to have three broad themes in terms of the evolution of skill demand and training needs by Brasana Tambe and Davo Misklin. Then we will hear from Lin Wu on robotics, automation and the impacts of, uh, of those technologies on organization design. And finally, we'll hear from Peter Norlander and James White on the role of institutions in software and workers' bargaining power. And so what I wanna do during the presentations is to use the chat actively. So please post your questions and comments to the speakers and I'm sure they would love to answer them as soon as they're done presenting. But let's keep the general discussion to the end so that we make sure we get through all the presentations first and then keep the last 20 to 30 minutes to a general discussion that I will moderate, okay? So I'd, without any further ado, I'd love to pass the floor on to Prasanna. Please go ahead. Um, I believe you're able to share your slides. All right, thanks, Thank Victoria. Let me, let me try to share them and see how that goes. I will um, no, not yet. Looks like I'm still waiting on a, a sharing. Okay, you should be able to. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Good. Uh, everyone can see the slides okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thanks uh, for the introduction and thanks for bringing uh, these all, all these uh, different participants and comments together. Uh, looks like a really interesting uh, session. And Victoria's comments really set up uh, my, my brief comments really, really well. So I'm going to be focusing on a piece of this, which is um, uh, AI and data literacy as potentially core skills. And I'm really going to be talking today about um, the the impact of AI and data literacy on the non tech workforce and why that why why I think that's a place to uh, spend some time uh, thinking about. So when we think about who should be having AI skills, and right now, of course, I, I think for a lot of organizations, AI currently requires you know significant engineering resources. You sort of have to marshal software and data and people. Uh, and capital and uh, computation and so on to get that together. And so the, the hill to climb, the mountain to climb is pretty, pretty steep. So I think for a lot of organizations, it still feels fairly distant. Um, but I'm going to try to make the case today that might be a little bit of an illusion and that it might be here quicker, more quickly than we think. And that's going to have implications uh, not only for, for tech workers, of course, we hear a lot about that, but also for, for everybody else, everyone who touches AI decisions. So you know, as we know, algorithmic decisions are, are complex when embedded in an organizational context, right? I mean, we hear about bias and ethics and all these things all the time. So, so uh, what, what goes along with that is that increasingly, it seems like in many areas, criminal justice, healthcare, HR, it's the domain experts rather than the engineers who are best positioned to really evaluate some of the trade-offs associated with using AI. And this has been going on for a while, this sort of understanding how to organize human capital around AI. But we have this kind of tension where engineers are the bottleneck, but really when it comes to deploying some of these algorithmic decisions, it starts to involve people 
everywhere. And this is a little bit, a little bit different for AI than other technologies because it is actually is a decision maker where prior technologies have informed decisions, but they haven't been a decision maker. Okay, so this is the current state of the world. The mountain firms have to climb to get to this point is, is pretty high, but it's, it's changing really quickly is the point I wanna make today is that industry forces are coming together to make it easier and faster to deploy AI systems. And at least in the US, that's a big tech story and China as well, I think Baidu and Tencent. Uh, but around the world globally, there are forces at play that are really coming together to make it so that it's becoming easier and easier to put these into place. And this is then going to have downstream implications for who needs AI skills. And it's worth a discussion or consideration of what those skills should look like. And as Victoria said, maybe who should be paying for them, where they should be acquiring for them and so on. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, some of the most complex machine learning logic is becoming made available through easy to access packages. This is a picture of uh, one from Google that's making some of its deep learning logic available through a package called TensorFlow. The basic takeaway here is that what was once very difficult to put into software is now becoming easier for more and more firms to access because it turns out that you can use these packages and start to implement deep learning in your own organization. This is a meme I kind of like to show saying, what is deep learning? A lot of stuff here is what society thinks I do, kind of the Skynet robot, what my friends think I do, a big brain on a circuit, other computer scientists think I do, you know, lying on piles of cash, what mathematicians I think, and so on. But what I wanna bring your attention to is that lower right-hand corner, what I actually do when I'm doing deep learning these days, is just grabbing a package and using a package and just hauling it and being done with it. So it becomes quite easy, even from a software side, to start to implement deep learning. And this is becoming easier and easier. So this is sort of, that was sort of the first step. No code interfaces are rolling out faster than ever that make it easier to deploy AI models. So it's no longer difficult to find no code interfaces that are drag and drop tools that will let you deploy machine learning model. I've used many of these and they're very user friendly. They're, they're uh, and they, they, you know, they, they sort of explicitly say that our goal here is to make it easy and fast to create machine learning models for anybody. And so if you have the data in place, this is something that's not hard to get up and running on. And this is the explicit goal of many organizations, right? They realize that this bottleneck where an engineers are sitting between algorithmic decisions and people with the actual data is kind of an artificial one in some ways. So there's a lot of benefit from a productivity perspective if everyone is quote unquote a developer, if not a coder, at least a developer in the sense of putting together an AI uh, workflow. So those two things, we've got software, we've got these no code interfaces, computation, of course, as we know, has become a rentable resource. And so Amazon, Google, again, in the US, Baidu, Tencent, in China, Tesla's in this game as well, more and more organizations that have lots of computational power um, are, are, are making this available for a price for people to use. So you don't need that, those computers, you don't need that compute cycle in house, you can basically get it externally. Uh, for 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 a price. So you have all these things and now you have all of these things coming together increasingly. So if you look at what some of the big tech firms are doing, they're bringing these things together one, two and three. So software interfaces and computation in a way that these AI workflows are becoming almost trivially easy to set up and deploy. And so um, for these are some quotes from from Sundar Pichai and, and Jeff Dean, who are both at Google. I'll just stick with the Google example, but this is happening at Microsoft, Amazon, IBM. You can pick your favorite example. So Sundar Pichai here is saying that's why we've created an approach called AutoML, showing that it's possible for neural nets to design neural nets. You know, that's kind of science fiction sounding, but what it means in practice is that it turns out that we're automating the automation, right? And so when it comes to building a AI workflow, even that's being done by um, through 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 machine learning in a sense, or through 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 computational power, I should say. And so the idea here explicitly is to make these capabilities available, take it from a skill that's available to a few highly skilled people, and just make it available uh, to more and more people. Jeff Dean, who's a a, a very uh, well known uh, engineer says something similar that a hundred time computational power, which you know firms like this do have access to, could replace the need for any machine learning expertise. And, and it's th this is you know a hard picture to deconstruct, but let me just tell you what to take away from it. And I've used these platforms many times. I use many times, I use them in my classes as well. But you what, what they do is they take you from a workflow. You know, the goal is always to go from a data 
to a decision, right? When we're talking about AI, what these platforms do is they take it from a world where you have to do all this in between in terms of data preparation, model selection, feature engineering, and so on, to one where once you have the data, you, you literally just press a button and Google will deliver back to you or Amazon or whichever your vendor is in a few hours, the absolute best model you can use. And there's not even anything you can touch. There's a single button you press. And at the end, you get the model you can put into production and you pay a price, which is the computational resource. And we can, you know, some other day, there's an interesting conversation to be had about how the industry is changing from a com competitive perspective and why they're doing this. But what I wanted to focus on today is what this means from a skills perspective, because when it is, when it's the case that AI becomes easier to implement, and I would argue it's becoming very easy to implement, then it potentially changes the focus uh, on, on the labor market. Because right now, most of it's focused on tightness in the market for data engineers, data scientists, machine learning engineers. But I would argue that in a very near future, this productivity bottleneck is not actually going to be that. It's going to become how effectively these business experts that are downstream can interact with AI tools, right? And so these might be dealing with questions about research or uh, a design of A-B experiments or ethics or uh, whether bias exists in the models or how it fits into the organization. But that's the skills gap that I would argue is going to potentially be of most interest going forward when we're talking about uh, AI and data productivity. It's a sort of AI and data literacy in non-tech workers because where we're focused right now, which is the high costs of implementing AI systems, that's going to fall and potentially fall dramatically very quickly. And it's going to introduce a uh, uh, focus on a different kind of skills gap. And that's the main point I wanted to make today. Uh, happy to take questions on that and look forward to the discussion later on. Thank you, Prasanna. So let's hear from Davor and then maybe we can collate some questions. Please use the chat if you have any questions and comments we're ready and I will moderate the discussion. So Davor, welcome. Please go ahead if you would like to share anything. Yeah, thank you. First need to unmute. Yeah, uh, so, so, Sony, thanks for that. You know, it kind of reminded me just quickly, by the way, firstly, I'm not a researcher, I'm not academic, academic but that's okay. I work with, with you guys on the data side, but it reminded me a little bit this analogy what you said about AI. It's kind of like basically agriculture, you know, when you know, prediction was what half of us would be doing agriculture and feeding other half. And now I think what 2% is doing agriculture and we have too much food, maybe it's not distributed as it should be. But there is some logic. I mean, I know it sounds futuristic what you said, but it's quite interesting that uh, you kind of said it because I didn't hear anyone actually saying this. There is this acute focus on what's going on now. Just quickly, let me share the screen. And I'm showing how, uh, how uh, relatively how relatively limited we are, you know, I can't do two things, speak and choose my share really effectively. That's where we are. Okay, look, in terms of uh, uh, what I'm trying to, what I will do, I will just quickly say about uh, Burning Glass now, MC Burning Glass after merger, because some people know, some people maybe don't know, very quickly, uh, not trying to do sales presentation here, and then just focus on two recent reports, uh, which are applied research team um, done for the um, Asia Pacific Economic um, Cooperation region, um, because I, you know, giving giving uh, this is kind of like a Singapore led, as I understand, to the degree uh, I think it would be appropriate. Basically, looking at the digital in the region, what is what is doing, what is you know what trends we are seeing, and then you know some predictions in terms of. Um, you know, where we see, you know, the next steps are. Not that much on the education that's uh, explained to Victoria, that's not our expertise in terms of now where you can go and obtain and how, I think that's another subject. But at least in terms of granularity of the skills, I think we have enough data to start making some conclusions. So in terms of what we do very quickly, basically focusing on the job uh, vacancies, um, you know, in large numbers, large number of sources, um, US, Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, UK, but also European region, also starting to do some initial work in Latin America, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, um, Colombia, a couple other countries, as well as actually in uh, APEC, uh, we did some projects and there are some initial reports and more will come in terms of the data as well as obviously insights from Malaysia, Indonesia, and hopefully I would say next year or year after Philippines. Um, so just what I'm trying to say to people here, we're really trying to get this kind of global pulse. And you know, this is roughly the process. You go to the large number of sources. This is not just a couple of job boards. Really, it's trying to collect, you know, 
jobs, as I say, from dishwasher to blockchain developer and anything in between. This is not just trying to focus on a single. So to get this kind of full, granular view of the labor market demand, as expressed by the voices of employers, you know, what they need, what they see. Think about job vacancy also as something which emphasize really what is acute. So it's not every skill I need, but really the one I need or maybe a minimum to engage with uh, with uh, in interview, in discussion, in forward, you know, I, I am interested in, in this particular candidate because he's matching my skills. And one thing I want to say, just to kind of a little bit influence everyone here, and, and not to scare is um, uh, what we're seeing, for example, on the education side and the language employers are using is, let's say in UK, the latest thing, 90%, I mean, it's, it's almost extreme, of these vacancies don't mention any educational credentials. They just basically talk skill. It doesn't mean education is not expected, education is not desired, but it's not anymore that first signal they use to attract someone. I think there is interesting, uh, uh, how to say, learnings from that, or at least probably saying that if I advertise with education, I will not get skill set combination, which I'm expecting. So you know what, let me remove that proxy. Let me go directly with the skills. I just wanted to leave because, you know, you are in education and dealing with students and, you know, in a way producing the supply. It's a message, I think, which shouldn't go kind of, um, you know, under the radar. And, you know, I, I'm kind of listing here uh, a couple of steps and stuff. So basically, you know, that's what we've been, been doing since around 2010 onwards and continue and we'll do more. So this is this, this is kind of our objective. And then um, maybe maybe some uh, some quick uh, things, you know, that we obviously observe the uh, COVID and influence on that. What really on a very high level COVID done on a digital space is it basically just accelerated everything by, I don't know what factor, you know, no one can measure that, but probably three, four, five, you know, if we measure in the years, particularly, you know, if you start focusing on sectors like education and stuff and all this, you know, move to the online. I mean, it's just basically, you know, we are kind of on, on, on another level of, of, of progress there. In that sense, almost sounds a little bit maybe, you know, and it's a bit hard to say, kind of COVID helped. And I, I'm sure you understand what I'm trying to say with that to kind of make that transition. On the other side, what it created is obviously suddenly that need of remote work and, you know, what kind of skills, tools and etc. and how we need to organize ourselves uh, uh, um, from the labor market perspective, uh, um, you know, it, it induced that change. Uh, one interesting change which induced that sometimes if you were in the um, uh, and I'll use our company as an example, you know, we have offices in Boston, we have also offices in Idaho, in, in Moscow, and it kind of a little bit been like, look, uh, Idaho, Moscow, not center of the world, but, you know, we have a very stable workforce, it's one of the best places to work, we offer these advanced uh, roles, you know, data, etc., etc., you know what I'm talking about, so kind of we have less competitive pressure because there's no Amazon around, you know, there's no Facebook around, there's no etc., etc. around. However, with this remote, I can tell you this is like uh, not not report or measure, but this is from practitioner, so actually we started to notice pressure because suddenly now this acceptance of the idea that I can be in position X and work in position Y, and no one sees that as strange, not productive, not possible, a little bit odd, kind of disappeared. So actually, we now are, you know, more or less feeling the same pressure, I would say, as those people who are, you know, not far away in Seattle, in San Francisco, in, in Silicon Valley or Los Angeles. And uh, there are some, uh, uh, and I will share this uh, presentation, which was done actually by our chief economist, you know, for, for one of the things I will share this with you, just to kind of try to demonstrate uh, uh, this, uh, you know, approach, uh, data from the vacancies, real time, everything is two days behind what we do. So it's really literally, you know, what happened last week, not what happened last quarter or last year. And it has uh, uh, certainly value and, and uh, um, gives you that kind of advantage. It's not trying to, or we are not trying to say, hence, you know, these surveys should not be used or they're not good. We feel it really should complement each other. You know, we as a, a or, or this approach as immediate, real time, but noisier and other approach, which can be uh, uh, obviously much cleaner. Uh, um, it is on the higher level. Um, however, it can go deeper in certain things. You can, you know, really probe 
with surveys, uh, uh, um, particular you know niche things, which you know this type of observation just going to the job uh, through what through vacancies as a, as as a signal uh, has this limitation in terms of and then but what about this you know we cannot ask any questions we don't know who applied for the jobs etc etc in terms of. Uh, Maybe what 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 we he, he here for and what was discussed. I would just like to emphasize, and again, I would share uh, those two reports. Uh, so one was done last year together with LinkedIn. LinkedIn a little bit more focused on the on the uh, uh, I would say uh, supply supply side. We were more on the demand, and basically. Uh, uh, what is maybe interesting to see as uh, some of the conclusion. So the report is basically uh, uh, fixed in two, and then you know, for us, you know, looking at the, at, 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 at the demand, uh, um, these were the and this is in the region. So this is looking at Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, uh, Canada, US as obviously you know Pacific region countries. We did not in this report include Malaysia and Indonesia yet. In the other one, which was just released literally this month. We did, and uh, uh, I'll provide links and basically upload those. We can see these key findings, you know, in terms of uh, obviously demand for digital going, you know, significantly up, and what we know is also almost penetrating every occupation. I, I, it's probably a better question to ask where it's not penetrating, and that's a hard to answer because it's almost impossible to find where the digital didn't touch. It touched almost everything. Uh, uh, then, for example, seven out of ten, around seventy percent, sixty-nine, actually to be exact, uh, 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 are in digital in the region, and this in intensification of uh, uh, um, remote work, digitalization fueling even further and then obviously last but not at least and it was one of the topics on this or, or goals for sure if we can increase digital literacy you know the, the pay the equality etc etc will improve i mean the, because you know when you look these these ads obviously around roughly 25 percent of them have salary attached at least salary which is advertised which is okay is that exactly what they got? Doesn't really matter. It's advertised, collected on a systematic basis. So we can see, you know, that uh, uh, um, digital skills increase. Um, we can even go down to the level of measuring, you know, particular skills and how much they contribute, a particular role to the salary. If you have tensile flow or not, does it matter? By simply removing in and out skills and seeing if the advertised salary changes. So again, it's not. Uh, it's not our own opinion, it's basically experimenting with the data and almost like you can start putting value of the skills. So, you know, anecdotally, I can say for someone who is starting, you know, focus on budgeting, focus on project management, it will help you across wide ranges of the jobs. And really what I will f finish and conclude, and uh, maybe I'm thinking now a little bit on the spot, what would be actually also good to share, just to show you what is possible, why not? Uh, um, what, uh, what, uh, just a sec, what I think really we need here in terms of particularly uh, population, so, oh, here we are. I'll change, stop share, just a sec. It's, it's this map of the labor market, that's what I'm trying to say. We need basically a Google map, I don't know if people are familiar. This is for United States, but exists for Australia too, and I'll jump quickly in. It's just focusing on a cyber space, think about that small universe, and basically show, telling people, I think, you know, democratization of the data, let's inform those whom this is all done for, i.e. workers, students, learners, whatever definition you want, you know, how do I enter into the, into the cyberspace? And then once I am, you know, what are the possible paths? What are the roles? How big they are, in this case, in US markets, but again, there is a data, wherever we have it, we could develop it. And again, it has been done for Australia. I'm showing US here, just, I remember the, 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 the address faster. And then, you know, all sorts of, uh, 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 underlying, you know, information signals. Employers, again, themselves are uh, uh, pushing 
uh, to the market and saying what they need, what they don't need, what are the certifications to focus, etc., etc. I think you get a picture, and uh, obviously, what the data allows you is not just looking at the at the, at the, um, uh, certain certain distributions like this. But I wanted to show you here, for example, you can start from either of the angles, and I think that's what you know in terms of you know linking to the Sony's AI thing previously was. Uh, uh, much harder, almost impossible, particularly on the job seeker learner level. You know, if I if I if I know some skills, you know, how do I go from skills towards the job title? Or if I have certification, where do I focus then? Or if I have a particular role in mind, you know, how do I go left and right? You know, do I or should I do some in terms of certification? And by the way, what are the top skills if I am Think about being cybersecurity manager. Do I miss any, etc.? I so firmly uh, believe that by uh, pushing this out, and I'm already seeing some uh, uh, evidence of this through this. More, it's coming. Um, university started to engage in this in terms of providing this as something alongside uh, 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 career services and when students are, you know, studying to be kind of more or less non-stop in touch with the labor market, see how it's changing, and then accordingly adjust, adjust their decisions. So I'll stop here because I think others will have more uh, deeper insight. Again, I'm not a researcher. I just wanted to kind of position us in terms of the data It's there. Sony tells us automatic AI is coming. And I think uh, it's just uh, how to say onwards and upwards from here. Uh, and thank you again. Um, Victoria for uh, giving me the opportunity, inviting me to uh, present here. Thank you, Dower. I should uh, mention, just I should just mention quickly that my high level comments on AI were informed in part by a low level uh, analysis that includes the burning glass data. Um, so that was a piece that fed into some of my higher comments, which captures some of the skill richness that Devor was mentioning. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so let's get a move on and move on with the presentation. So Lynn, go ahead. The floor is yours. And tell us a little bit about robotics and organization design. And I think I think you're still muted. I think at least I cannot hear you. Okay, great. So you see the slide? Yes. Awesome. Okay, awesome. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm talking, I'm talking about robots a little bit in this uh, talk. And uh, I guess, you know, with all the amazing introductory, I don't need to motivate how, you know, we hear so much popular press report about ro robocalypse coming and eating all our jobs. And uh, what I'm trying, what I'm going to show you is that in my recent research uh, to debunk some of this myth and see what uh, real problems are really associated with robots and, um, and automation. And uh, so let's talk about, does robot affect employment, right? So you, the popular answer is that that is negative for employment, um, but it's also possible that, as Victoria mentioned, that increasing productivity from this automation-related technology will, will, you know, pr will prompt, we have greater performance and productivity, which in turn, increased demand, and then we may have a net positive in employment. So what we did is actually we studied about um, 168,000 Canadian firms from 1996 to 27. And we have uh, data on exact the robot adoption they have each, each establishment within each firm even. And uh, we capture how and we also have the tax filing data, so we know about the revenues and we know about the employment. So this is what we found year after year, what happens after firms robot adopts robots. So this is how you read this graph. So zero is the year you adopt, and a negative number are the years before you adopt. So negative one is a year before, number two, uh, negative two is a year at, uh, before you adopt, two years before you adopt robots. And positive one and positive two are one or two and two years after you adopt robots. So you can clearly see this is not at least an, uh, at least a national average Canadian firm. This is from Canadian statistic. Can, can, uh, it's a Canadian census equivalent, and this is what, what they're showing here is very different picture from the industry country level study. This is a firm level study that shows that employment actually has gone up after firm has adopted robot. Okay, and uh, so. 
So it seems like, oh, we, maybe it's all rosy story. We, we don't need to worry about it. It seems like the more you adopt technologies and the, the, uh, the better, better, better off you are. But our research have shown that that's actually the wrong question to ask. The real question to ask is how robots are changing the way firms are organized, how skills are shifting in terms of what kind of labor they, do, they require, what they demand. And that labor composition is really changing. And that is a real impact from uh, the automation, robot, robotic-based automation that we've seen in our, in our research. Okay, to give you, a, to give you an idea, um, what is going on, okay? So this is broken down by skill level. In a sense, we, we don't have amazing burning glass skill <laughs> composition, but here we just have uh, high skill labor as those people who have college or above education. And middle skill labor are people who, have a, who, who graduate from high school, have some kind of associate tra uh, training or some associate degrees. And low skill labor are just those without a high school degree or, or high school equivalent, right? So you can see that although we see a net positive um, labor after firms adopt robots, okay? And what we see here is that this is a total, like the average was in the graph I showed you before, but look at the heterogeneity across different skill levels, right? We see moderate high skill labor demand for high skill labor. We see much higher demand on low skill labor. So these people are, you know, require, these, these, are, these are workers who have, require very little training, which is doesn't even require high school degree sometimes. But we really see the dramatic downsizing of middle skill labor. And these are the people with associate degrees uh, were just finished high school, have some kind of certification uh, in training. Okay, so again, this is an entire, uh, an entire uh, economy of, of uh, Canadian economy. So this really includes uh, all kinds of occupation that you could imagine. And uh, interestingly, that we do see a downsizing of a specific type of labor in addition to middle skill labor, and that is supervisors and managers. Okay, that is surprising given that managers, by definition, manage people. So how could a robot or AI-based automation could replace managing people? And but actually, this is what we see. Remember, this graph is the the gray on the, the gray graphs on the, on the left is the total em employment graph. And this is the equivalent of that graph for supervisors or managers. So we're talking about supervisor or middle management here, okay? So here we see that in the paralleling, uh, paralleling the, uh, the, the uh, you know, the before adoption, there's not much going on before adoption, but when they adopt, you see a dramatic decrease on, on the year they adopt, and then, then stabilizing for a year or two, another drop later, right? And I think that comes from a lot of the organizational changes that uh, this new type of automation technology will require, and that may require a different generation of managers, different generation of supervisors. And we see it, we see this both in total number of uh, managers, headcounts, as, as well as turnovers and, uh, hi and new hires, okay? And uh, this is not just about, oh, managers are really expensive and we should just, you know, we have robots and they're, they're, they're cheaper and let's just hire, let's use these robots instead of managers, right? And uh, we actually find that if that's the case, then you imagine each manager, the existing, the, the ones that are left behind would have a much greater power than before, right? So this is actually what we see that we see who are making decisions on these tasks for a variety of tasks. And I'm just showing two examples here. We are see, what we're observing here is that, you know, for many of the tasks, okay, we see the manager's decision rights are being allocated away from them. They're either going to the line workers themselves, okay? So for example, for decision on what training they should get. Okay, so apparently uh, in, 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 the, in, in, the, in, this, in the automation world, managers are giving that rights away to non-managers. And for decisions like what production technology they should choose to, for the work they do, and managers are again not making that decision anymore, and that shifting toward the firm owners, the C C-level execs. So what we're seeing here is not only do managers actually decrease in headcount, but their decision rights allocation are going away. So they're we're both seeing a, a both centralizing effect on some decisions and decentralizing effects on some some other decisions. But in both cases, they're moving the rights away from the middle management. 
Okay, so what, is, what do these collectively, these, uh, these story tell, tell us, right? So number one is that um, the story of, uh, of robots, you know, hers unemployment is somewhat, a, you know, somewhat a myth still. And I think in our firm level study, which is rare, um, compared to firm level study, the industry level study, we actually see that robot adopting firms are more productive and therefore they hire more people. So how do we reconcile the industry evidence that we see a robocalypse? It turns out that the reduced unemployment come from primarily from those firms in the same industry who did not adopt robots, right? So they actually get killed by competition and they had to, do, they had to lay off workers as a result. So the firm who adopt robots are doing really well at expense of the non-robot non option firm. So this is a not so this is not a direct substitution story as the um, as prior research has shown. Like robots are literally taking the people out of work. Here's a competition story where the robot adopting firms are, are doing really well compared to the non-adopting firms. Okay, and more specific on labor side is like even is that even though we see a net positive, actually pretty positive, pretty you know big increase in employment over time uh, to robot based automation. We see that um, the workforce composition has changed dramatically, and this is really at the expense of middle skill work. Those people um, with with just associate degrees, which is high school degrees, with uh, with you know a few years of training on the job. Okay, and we also see the less supervisory work, so middle management. Okay, this means that we have we really had to think about how do we retrain workers and create this middle middle skilled work. I think Sunny presented a really interesting work saying, well, we really should train the people who work with AI, those people who really know the business processes. I think middle skill workers probably are in that level of work and then we need to train them to make sure they can interact with AI. And, uh, and maybe, maybe it's an even greater trend. Maybe there will, be, will just be generally less middle skill work, less supervisory work. What's, what happened in that world then? And it means that we're gonna have a lot of high skill workers a lot of low skill workers and low skill workers cannot just become high skill workers without tremendous effort. That means going to college, doing, uh, you, know, uh, you know, it's not just some training, a few, uh, you know, uh, on job training can do. So that means we may have to rethink about the social, uh, social contract with low skill workers in a sense, how do we provide a greater safety, safety net for these workers? Because these like, you no know, picker packers job at Amazon are not gonna be the entry work that you expect moving up in middle school work and to supervisory work. And these people are just going to be stuck in this, um, potentially stuck in this low skill work. And that's, you see the rising, um, rising uh, you know, unionization effort, Amazon, other places. So there's gonna be, the needs of kind of a greater policy debate on how do, how do we provide, how to provide these kind of uh, safety net for low skill workers. And, and, uh, and most importantly, we, we, we got a faster, innovation entrepreneurship in a sense, how do we discover these new middle skill work or how do we train this middle skill work to understand AI robot, robot optimization in the sense that they can actually do the best of what they can translating what they do and to enable AI to do their, to, to help them do their job better, okay? And uh, so that, because that is really key for future innovation productivity. We, and uh, there are lots of current policy uh, EU and others have saying we have to, we need to uh, lead, uh, you know start a, a robot tax and our research shown that is actually not good in the sense that we see that robot adoption actually is good for firms and improve employment is really about um, helping those firms who are not in the automation world become better automation and and uh, to improve innovation productivity and our work is to figure out how do we help the uh, you know middle skill worker middle skill Go workers um, to land in this new uh, new technology based economy, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fascinating work. Um, so we have two more presentations, and we're sort of running towards the end of the first hour. So let's go ahead and hear from Peter and James, and then we will close up with some discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Victoria, for the opportunity to uh, be here with the organization design community. So I'll talk about power relationships. I'll try to be brief. Um, uh, I'll talk in a few different contexts where I've done some research in offshore outsourcing, in platform-based gig work, and co post-COVID remote work. And the claims I want to evaluate are really the uh, claims that there's an emancipatory potential to um, the technology. and 
uh, let me just go first into offshore outsourcing. If you remember the early 2000s, Thomas Friedman and the idea of a uh, the world is flat and that technology will shrink the playing field or um, you know shrink the world and level the playing field, enabling new entrants into the global labor market, creating a labor market in tradable services, and that firms around the world and countries will have to compete in a war for talent. Uh, the context here is one where I've looked closely at the organizations that are actually the large offshore outsourcers and the firms, and looking also at the situation of the workers and the power relationship between workers in this area. What I've uh, wound up studying a lot is the, the monopsony power of firms. And essentially the, the golden ticket of globalization here is an opportunity to earn a much higher wage in a country uh, where there's, there's a lot of uh, global inequality. So although the potential to work anywhere has been there, uh, in actuality, in the offshore outsourcing industry, 25 to 30% of workers are co-located with, um, you know, in a, in a uh, host nation. So uh, this opportunity um, has been, I think, uh, captured by companies that uh, then have some power over the workers and, and can distribute the profits to the shareholders, where um, there are barriers for workers to quit their jobs, both in the, in the countries that uh, workers come to and um, the countries where workers are um, located because of the, the opportunity being held by these companies. In platform-based gig work, just uh, quickly, the liberation promise here is that you can be your own boss and these firms uh, offer an opportunity to have more efficient matching of supply and demand. Um, the economics textbook says, you know, it's, it's liberating us from the centrally planned economies of uh, city regulations. And uh, in actuality, I think when I looked at this in the uh, O'Hare parking lot with hundreds of waiting livery car drivers and Uber drivers in an experiment where I asked those drivers whether they uh, felt how much control they felt from the organization they work for. And I just randomly assigned them into an Uber condition or a livery car driver condition. They're, they're both livery car drivers and Uber drivers. They felt more managerial control in the Uber condition. Interestingly, uh, this promise of technology to gamify or create more interesting work out of task did seem, seem to have some merit because workers record, reported greater task enjoyment in the Uber condition and no decrease in motivation. The uh, field interviews are just interesting here because uh, the workers and, and the drivers, they say, you know, it's all about globalization and one company is going to own the whole transportation in the world and, and kill the competition. Uh, you get an ear fill in the, in the parking lots, uh, but, uh, also, just that it's the same as working for any other company. They have lineups, rules, and regulations. Um, these, these ideas are not foreign to the, the people on the ground. In the context of COVID and, and post-COVID remote work, we've just seen a return to the office in the United States, at least, that uh, is in line with where work from home was in the two decades prior to COVID. So we saw this huge increase, but basically, are we going to be free from working from the office? I think it depends a lot on our institutions, and I want to go back to this old offshore outsourcing framework. You may have seen it in the early 2000s, the idea that technology enables better supervision of work being done offsite or in a different firm. So you can have offshoring, you can have outsourcing, and you can have both. Well, if you take the same logic that information communication technology has made these possible, and then you just change the assumption that work is going to be done on a physical factory or office location, and then you can see that the logic, I think, has extended into these new domains of globally distributed platform work, virtual companies, and remote, remote work and, and remote outsourcing. So this is a new paper with Chris Erickson. It's now uh, published in the Industrial Relations Journal. And just uh, last thought here, the model we're thinking about is that technology's impact is indirect and it's mediated by institutions, by practical limitations, that there's bargaining that goes on at all levels between workers and teams about, can I work from home? Where do I work? between uh, you know, firms and their suppliers, between states and uh, the firms and capital and labor to basically you know, are workers independent contractors or are they employees? So um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I think uh, you know, the, the potential for technology has been captured in some way, I think so far by institutional actors or actors who um, have sought uh, this global domination, who are increasing firm power potentially. And the question for the future is, will uh, uh, these trends continue? So I, I look forward to hearing our next presenter too about other potential uses of technology. And sorry about that um, automatic uh, 
whatever that was. So thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. All right, last but not least, uh, Jamie White, go ahead. I think you are still muted. Yeah, hi there. I was just getting the, the presentation set up. Is that visible? Awesome. All right. Uh, hi there, everybody. I'm going to first, before even doing any slides, I thought about not doing any slides for this at all, do just a little bit of an overview of my thesis of where technology is going to take uh, collective bargaining and labor organizing. And I think it's going to empower the worker ultimately by making uh, uh, organizing and collective bargaining more self-serve and bottom up. I think it's going to include online curricula. I think it's gonna include legal automation, workplace mapping tools, worker democracy tools, and remote access to experts. Uh, I think this is gonna result in more accessible, secure, and fast paths to bargaining power uh, than we've ever seen before. Uh, as well as more workers trained and empowered to do this work, which is something very different than has happened over the last 70 or 80 years. Um, in regards to the UN sustainability goals, I think ultimately this is going to increase the unionization rate, decrease workplace employer retaliation, and longer term decrease the income gap. Uh, so I'm going to show a little bit of evidence and all that. I'm going to give an example, which, you know, is uh, uses the, the project I'm working on, but I think it's pretty representative. And, uh, and that's really the whole presentation here. I'm going to try to go pretty fast through it because I know we are short on time. So uh, I'm Jamie. Um, background is MIT, but I've always uh, loved humans a little more than technology. Um, founded unitworkers.com, which is the project I mentioned. Um, my background's in consumer app development and organizing. Um, I was jailed for protesting in support of unions and income inequality back in Boston. Uh, feel free to reach out to me, obviously, on, uh, on Twitter or anywhere else. Most people want to change something at work. Um, you know, satisfaction in various parts of work is different, but 77% of workers value that ability to change and about half of workers are not satisfied with their ability to enact that change. You can imagine uh, where on the income spectrum those 52% of workers fall. Unions are a powerful legal structure for making that change. Um, and just a kind of a disclaimer, most of the data that I'm gonna present from here on is US centric. I imagine the same is true for a lot of countries with labor law, labor law is actually pretty uh, uh, pretty uh, not protective in the US. So I hope in some other places it is also more. Um, in the US though, there's a requirement to bargain in good faith. There's unifying contracts for group negotiations and there's a method to collect dues for the organization, which are 14 billion in the US. So you know there is real power in these organizations, uh, even economically. Um, and it shows 23% higher wages for unionized employees, most people are favorable to unions and we're actually at an all-time high for that, especially uh, left-leaning and urban areas in the US. So what do these people want in a union when they, when they want one? Um, There's this big study done on, you know, if you could rewrite what a union is, what that would look like. Um, and it was pretty interesting. The biggest things that came out of that were people want collective bargaining, obviously, you know, uh, and then people want benefits, um, which, you know, is something almost every collective bargaining contract in the U.S. Uh, negotiates for. So what if you just did these two things, did collective bargaining and then use that collective bargaining to bargain for more benefits? Um, we think workers would like that a lot. And so simplifying the labor organization to doing just these two things and doing them really well, uh, I think is important. I think it's something technology is going to drive. I'm going to send this presentation out because I'm not going to be able to cover everything, but just a few more points of context here. Labor's become more top down. Uh, the issues people face in the U.S. today aren't, you know, getting their limbs cut off in factories for the most part. Uh, and so they don't have the same um, um, incentives as they did before for this organizing. So organizing has to be easier uh, if more people are going to be doing it. Law does not support workers in the U.S. It undermines their abilities to unionize. 
national labor doesn't have the capacity to organize these new workplaces. Surely the number of trained professional organizers doing this manually uh, is impossible capacity wise right now. Um, power is in these worker relationships. Technology is not going to replace that. And professional organizers are super important for this, but they're spending a lot of their time doing repetitive work. So as we're talking about automation, I think that's really important. It's having the, the human professionals in this equation doing the things that only they can do, which is great. Uh, and every workplace is unique, right? So uh, although I'm gonna generalize in some of the things coming, um, you should know that not, none of these solutions are perfect for all workplaces. There's gonna be a range of approaches here. So I wanna use the project I'm working on as an example, um, unitworkers.com. Uh, the idea is that we're helping uh, workers create labor unions. Um, in the US, most uh, new labor unions are affiliates. Uh, so these are national unions that uh, go into a workplace uh, that has asked to organize, expressed interest in organizing, they organize them and then they become part of that national labor union. Um, and so, so the organizing effort is led both in a bottom up, but also in a top down uh, fashion. Uh, what we're trying to do is uh, empower workers to do all of that work bottom up uh, and then either affiliate or not, depending on their, their preferences, but have that be a worker choice. So our pillars for that is making it accessible, worker centered and powerful. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all of these points, but you can imagine um, how technology can address some of those. And I'm gonna go into the details of the process here. So during the organizing phase um, it, with this, uh, with unitworkers.com, it's almost completely worker driven. So it's their communications, they run through the educational curriculum, self-serve, which I'll go over later. They invite their coworkers to do the same. Um, and they can sign in the US uh, to create a union. You have to sign an election petition with a majority of coworkers. They can start that process all on their own without ever talking to anybody unless they want to. Um, they can move in to an election, but that's where we get hands on because that's where everything about this becomes strategic, right? How is the boss going to fight back? What is the recognition contract going to look like, et cetera? And then after that, we support them in everything a union needs to do. Uh, and so that is literally getting their you know, charter set up to like finding an accountant to do their taxes. Uh, but for one fee, which is like a portion of their dues, we set all of that up for them from the outside. Um, and what's great about that is we become an advisor, not part of the governance of their union. So they can fire us anytime we want. Uh, which is great because that separates the services from the really important part of labor organizing, which is these worker relationships and what they want and how they negotiate with their employer. Uh, the education piece is super important to us. Um, and a lot of these articles uh, would be applicable actually outside the US. They're kind of uh, uh, overarching principles of labor organizing. So go check it out or share it, guide.unitworkers.com. Um, we're developing text message courses. We do, you know, seminars um, uh, over Zoom and we're launching more in January. I think this is the most important piece of what we're doing because when workers have the knowledge to make these things happen, which, you know, 60, 70% of people in the US support unions, I guarantee you that 99% of those people do not know what a union is or how it works. Um, and so this education is the most important piece of all this self-empowerment. Uh, just as an example, uh, there is a group in North Carolina called uh, Piedmont Health Services. They just went public, so I feel comfortable sharing this. Um, they had been trying to unionize for a while. They had called multiple national unions, but uh, as some of you may know, uh, North Carolina is a right to work state, which in the US means the state has passed laws that make it difficult for unions to collect dues. Um, and as such, national unions don't view it as strategic or economical normally to organize in these states. There's definitely exceptions to that. So North Carolina has the lowest union density in the US. Um, and these workers signed up on the website, got going, you know, got some momentum on their own, and then we started helping hands on. And uh, they're a prime example of folks that basically taught themselves to do this, right, and organize their workplace. They're also a smaller workplace. They're only 48 people. 
uh, which is another issue uh, with manual labor organizing. It's really hard to justify the cost of a full-time labor organizer to organize small workplaces. Um, and that's another area where I think technology is going to help so much is with these small businesses. So before I leave you, uh, I want to bring this back to the what we're all about here, the UN goals, what makes me personally passionate about all of this. Um, union membership precedes income gap changes, right? As you can see here, I, I think this graph, you may have already seen it somewhere, but I think one important thing that a lot of people miss in this graph is if you look at the red line, it precedes the blue, the blue part of this graph, right? Uh, and it's unclear by how many years that probably changes as technology progresses. But uh, needless to say, union membership precedes changes in the income gap. And when there's more unions, there's more income e equality, which is a great marker for all sorts of other work, worker conditions um, that are important to the UN goals. Um, and leaving you with that, uh, please stay in touch. Uh, we answer our direct messages. Uh, so either bug me personally or unit unionizing on Twitter or on the website, we have a chat. Thanks everybody. I'll send this Thank out so by much. the way, and we have some, uh, some resources uh, that this presentation was based on. Excellent, thank you so much. And we'll share those resources after the, after the session. Um, so with that, I think we have another 25 minutes left or so where we can open up to general discussion. There's already a couple of comments in the chat box. So if you'd like, actually, Metin, if you'd like to go ahead and ask the question verbally, um, and then we can just get the discussion going. We're quite a small group, so we should be able to have a uh, lively chat. With pleasure. Uh, thank you, Victoria, for organizing this session. And thanks to all the panelists. It was really uh very educative and, and very, very pleasant for someone who's studying organization design, as you can imagine. Uh, one of the things that I want to do with my apologies for a gajillion of typos <laughs> in, my, in my post, uh, the, the uh, United Nations uh, goals and the sessions that we have here, uh, they are connected in certain ways, naturally. Uh, one of the things that we discussed uh, last Thursday, um, just not, you know, it's this way, so it's fresh in memory. One of the things that was discussed last week uh, when talking about decent work, and many of the things that you were presenting today was uh, very much linked. One aspect that I might be, I thought it will be helpful to discuss a little bit more is uh, one of the things discussed last week is uh, in terms of decent work is one aspect is bringing you know uh, employees uh, more to the picture uh, and the one aspect that was discussed uh, as Jamie was discussing this the aspects of unionizing in so many levels and then other thing is the role of employees in addition to collective one within the organization in terms of the autonomy and delegation other aspects and so on uh, one thing they discussed and I even I was checking my uh, uh, library, this, the, there's a book by uh, uh, <laughs> uh, one of the, you know, two of the presenters from last week, and there's an English version that's coming by Ferrer, as is, yes, it's the collective bargain is the most important, I and mean, it's a very important aspect of this, but we need to also think about how to bring the employees into the decision making of the organization. They were giving off the examples of in different countries, uh, the aspects of giving them seats in the boards, uh, having them more direct light in terms of decision making. It is not just splitting the pie, you know, old school thinking of, uh, of that. Uh, I think it is already covered in the things that you mentioned, but do you mind uh, dis uh, discussing a little bit more about in terms of the organizing, bringing the employees in decision making beyond collective bargaining, what are your thoughts uh, moving forward? Was that one just directed at me or the whole panel? Sorry. I, I couldn't hear you, sorry. Was, well, was that question just directed at me or was that directed at the whole panel? Uh, I think it's the whole panel, but I thought it was more directly linked to you and Lynn, but I, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to put in a box, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 that, that, makes, that, that makes sense. I mean, other you uh, can ignore it, that's also fine. I'm, I'm happy to take a first pass at it. Uh, I mean, in short, I think, uh, empowering workers lead, creates pathways to all of these things. I think in the US especially, there's a lot of legal hurdles to making this happen, right? I think there are definitely laws that we could pass that would make it easier for workers to have a larger part in governance. Um, 
That said, though, there is nothing to stop a uh, um, a organization drive uh, to uh, from pressuring the employer uh, to include worker governance, um, including a seat on the board. Um, there are some issues with labor law in the U.S. that uh, makes it not mandatory for an employer to bargain over governance issues. So uh, workers in, an, in a recognized union in the U.S. cannot force their employer to bargain over that legally. Uh, but a lot of worker organization in history has been done illegally, right? And so th there's no reason that you know, workers cannot strike uh, or create pressure on their employer to include them in governance. Um, and I think we're going to start seeing more of that. We're also seeing more of that just in terms of providing uh, 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 labor and contract skills, right? We're seeing more co-op growth in the U.S. than I think we've ever seen in the history of the U.S. Uh, I think technology is also empowering that uh, and creating opportunities, especially for groups of people that would have been independent contractors to instead be their own firms that are democ democratically governed. Um, I'll just follow up a little bit uh, on the non-collective uh, non bargaining side of decision uh, rights. Um, I think that's a really great question. I think it's definitely something we should be all be considering, given that so much of the innovation on um, robots and AI is really user-driven in a sense. Like you see that, you know, in our uh, interview with the warehouses, like, you know, when they, adopt, when they adopt a new technology, right? The management often does not know how to use it effectively because the workers are doing it, right? So a lot of the decision rights, like what, how to do it effectively actually come from these low skill workers who are actually using it to say, oh, we actually, we should do it this way, we should do it that way. And I think uh, empowering these individuals like to really create a new set of business processes, that's gonna be in, uh, instrumental for firms to design better processes to improve the productivity. And I think that's like how to enable these workers to do it and reward them for it is a key, right? So in our example, we, we, we actually did it with the warehousing example, we actually find that, you know, it was only through so much interview, we found out who was responsible for that organizational change. And that did not propagate up to management. So that person is still a low wage worker, but that was precise, precise person that you should enable and maybe promote them. But somehow that was lost in translation. So how do we design an organization that uh, you know, reward them for and also enable them to do this kind of organizational change or business design processes is really the key going forward, in my opinion. One thing I see in the absence of uh, strong unions and uh, other enabling institutions is the rise of social movements and really addressing also the issues throughout a supply chain by going to the you know leading firm so there was an interesting paper in the ilr review i'll, I'll just paste a link here that uh, examines these issues but i think of the new york taxi workers alliance and their recent um, issues and campaign over debt and uh, uber and the regulation of the taxi and passenger car industry as an example of how workers are organizing outside of the typical channels and having a lot of success by lobbying their elected officials and uh, persuading the public also to support their campaigns. Can I ask a follow-up question to on this topic? And I apologize if you hear some lawnmowers in the background. Um, but 2020, or maybe it was 21, I've lost track of time. We saw a lot of energy around developers, software developers in particular, organizing around kind of CSR type issues. Uh, Google most visibly, Apple had a case as well. I'm curious as to if you had thoughts um, on what the needs and requirements of groups like that are and how they might differ uh, from in, in terms of organizing. So I guess this would be, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say this is a good one for Jamie. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so we saw Kickstarter, Glitch, uh, a couple of others um, uh, unionized, which is uh, very interesting, right? Kind of a, a first for those. Uh, and national unions, for example, are uh, creating whole new what are, um, um, uh, initiatives uh, and locals purely for tech workers. 
Uh, so CWA code, OPIU, I forget the name of it, but you know, there, there's a number of these. And so I think we're gonna, yeah, people have different issues than they did before, right? Um, and I think for some workers, that's definitely still pay. I think for some developers, that is also still pay. And you know, even if you're making $300,000 and working for Google, uh, you should know you could be making four hundred thousand dollars, and you know if that is bad on your conscience, you, conscience, you could donate the hundred thousand dollars to somebody who needs it a lot more than you. And so, you know, I, I think there still is bargaining power that needs to be leveraged in these. This is again another place where labor law in the U.S. is behind, though. So the issues that you mentioned, right, uh, that a lot of tech workers are negotiating for, which is more, you know, the, these uh, non-pay issues unless something you're nego negotiating for has to do directly with your working conditions, um, you cannot legally force the employer to come to the table and bargain on those in the US. Uh, there's a set of bargaining topics that are called mandatory. Now, that does not mean, especially at Google, right, that you cannot uh, create a press and societal pressure on the company that forces it to negotiate about these things. You just can't legally compel them to come to the table to bargain those issues. One thing I'm very uh, interested in following is the developments also at the subcontractors of these companies because they have an army of subcontractors. If you go to the Google headquarters, you'll see um, you know you have a separate badge swipe device if you are a contractor for uh, a large outsourced uh, offshore outsourcing firm like Infosys, Wipro, HCL, and in Pittsburgh, we now have 65 steel workers who have a contract. Um, they're not steel workers, they are information technology uh, workers. And the second class treatment of the secondary labor force that has less job stability, lower wages, uh, certainly not the $300,000 uh, workers. You know, I think there's a lot of potential there for organization of uh, and collective bargaining. Uh, there's also been very successful pressure campaigns on the lead companies, Google, Facebook, and so forth, to make sure they recognize that their subcontractors do not interfere with their workers' rights to organize. So uh, having a free campaign, rather uh, free of influence from anti-union consultants and so forth, is it something I'm, I'm watching. Thank you. Just briefly adding to that conversation, first of all, it's a delight to, to see some of these faces on this call. It's my first time joining. Um, there was an interesting piece in Logic Magazine. Um, I come from the practitioner side, and they've done a lot of interesting reporting um, and, and direct interviews with folks involved. They had a little supplement here. Um, some of the things that I find intriguing are exactly is, is there pressure on CSR? Does the pressure on CSR actually make any CSR changes? And how are the boundaries of how people understand their role in a group? It's not Jamie direct the, the union um, grouping themselves, um, but to what extent do these different groups interact? So there's, there's neat questions of what is the consciousness, you know, class consciousness, um, and how do you bring in folks who see themselves as white collar into other identities? Um, and then how does that shift also with the with PR and, and labor organizing tactics for legislative involvement in, in some ways? So I don't know the extent to which, and I, I believe this was your what you had shown, Peter, that I came in late, um, but the extent to which uh, um, legal changes uh, become involved in the definition of what is work um, and who are workers. Uh, so that, uh, that's been a really interesting magazine for me to follow. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think that the um, ESG thing, and I'm just beginning to do an empirical project related to the uh, theoretical model I presented, and it's actually working with burning glass uh, text data to try to build bespoke or custom measures of you know, what else does a job ad tell us, for example, about a firm? And when I was looking at ESG measures of labor practices, there's uh, some studies that suggest that they're not very reliable, that the measures that are put out to the market are, are uh, just, um, just not reliable on environment, but also on the social and on the labor part. So can we think about what 
data is already in the public domain perhaps or is available that can lead to better measures of what firms are doing. So do they include statements like we do not discriminate on the basis of union status in their job ads as a proactive or kind of uh, a, a affirmative measure that workers have a right to organize? Could we build a measure of that at the firm level for large companies in the US that are publicly traded? Something like that would be interesting. So I guess a follow-up question to this, and this would be for all panelists and maybe in particular to Lynn, Jamie, and Peter, is what's your sense of the COVID-19 pandemic and the discussion on the shortages of workers and the rising wages for some segments of the labor market and how that might be impacting both their willingness and ability to organize, um, but also to bargain for decision rights with organizations. Do you see any evidence that this is this is helpful in kind of restructuring people's jobs and, and their ability to capture some of the value they generate? Or have you so far not been able to see anything of that sort? And feel free to jump in. Sure, I'll, I'll just take that. Here in, in Illinois, I think the big news has been the John Deere tractor strike, which uh, one wound up in a resounding success for the um, factory uh, farm equipment workers. And the uh, significance of key, you know, uh, strikes, I think is really important. And in, in this, the Starbucks one, where you have two stores out of three unionizing, and then the national raise in wages, I think there's, there's something happening, but it's always too soon to say, you know, whether it's a trend or a blip. Um, but uh, certainly, I think worker power has increased during the pandemic in many industries and occupations where there are feelings of shortages. We haven't had a good labor market though for like my entire adult life. So I, I would say a very good, strong labor market that lasts for a while that creates a hot demand in, across sectors, across occupational skill levels and so forth. Yeah, uh, one, I agree with everything Peter said. We, we you know, our data tracking that we do got started uh, uh, during the pandemic. So we actually, don't have a ton of data that, that you can't get publicly. Um, but I will say one anecdotal data point is uh, as far as we can see on average, less workers are getting fired for unionizing, which is a common retaliation tactic uh, that is not allowed under law, but still happens. Um, and uh, we're seeing less of that. Uh, and I think that's probably because people are worried about being able to replace them. One, uh, one. Sorry, go ahead. No, you, you, you go ahead. You are. <laughs> I was going to ask uh, a, a follow-up question here, which is, you know, employers kind of have a history of um, designing jobs in a way to capture power, um, you know, over time, over long, over over decades. And I'm wondering if anyone, we're in the middle of this sort of massive shift to remote work that I know many of you have been thinking about. I know Peter, you've been thinking about this as well. But is there evidence that, you know, you wonder over the course of months and years as they think about how to redesign jobs this way, um, if, if there are concerns here about what it means for bargaining power on the worker side? Because it, it, again, like Peter, like you mentioned, it's very similar to the offshoring discussion, right? Maybe Lynn first and uh, to answer Victoria's question first and then, yeah. Oh, I, I, um, I just have very uh, just a simple thing to add, like uh, anecdotal, anecdotally, I definitely see COVID-19 has accelerated automation, like the use of AI, cloud and computing, cloud computing and uh, robotics. Uh, the, the effects hasn't been really on the bargaining power, but it's really about redesigning the processes. So we haven't seen, it's like a lot of firms, like, oh, wait, we cannot, we cannot have people flip burgers for us. So let's install those burger flippers on stadiums then to, to alleviate this uh, labor shortage. But uh, as numerous examples have shown that just plug in a robot with replacing human just, just doesn't work. And actually they've seen productivity decreases because of that. And uh, that, you know, so it, the effort to, to really uh, automate replacing human at a whole scale hasn't uh, achieved with flying colors, I guess. So <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that, um, what I'm trying to say that I think that it doesn't mean it won't be it won't happen eventually um oh i don't know sorry i don't know why my video is off it, but um but what it does what it does show is that there's going to be a lots of uh, business 
process redesign, <clears throat> innovation happening right now, and that will just change the worker composition. That will change what type of skill they need, what kind of uh, things that things they would they would they uh, the firm require, and and that I think is a much bigger problem. And because you, you can you can you can bar you can have collective bargaining, but if the you know they don't really need the type of skill you, you have anymore, then what does it mean, right, for 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 these workers? Devor, did you want to? Yeah, I, I just a uh, 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 you know layman comment here. Uh, you guys are deeply into that subject. That's why I'm in the background. I'm just thinking like let's not forget this intervention by the governments in terms of the COVID and what I call cash in hand which I think at the bottom level removed, and for the right purposes, I'm not trying to argue that it was good or bad, but it was done, then it prevailed, it's slowly tapering off. But I know from some anecdotal discussions with people in business saying, I can't get anyone on the low level because basically they're getting more or less what I would pay them or just a little bit less, but they don't need to do any work. But I was also thinking what that could create if I, you know, we've done that and on that certain level, and people were having income, they didn't need to work, they had time, they think, do they want to go back to the same role? A little bit what I'm seeing around the hospitality and the restaurant, but people permanently decided, I just had you know, a couple of discussions by chance, I'm connected to you know, some, someone in baking and et cetera. Like, I just don't want to go back to that. Like, I'm never going back to that. And I think you know, in hospitality and, and some of these roles, we might see this kind of uh, unintended consequences of that policy intervention kind of swinging large proportion of the workforce to something totally else. They just don't want to go back to that. That chronic shortage, let's say in hospitality and et cetera, could prevail for quite some time. They're just me, but guys, no research, no deep uh, data focus is just by reading and having uh, interest in the subject. Uh, to to Prasanna's uh, question there, I, I think that you know, changes in the social contract, which I think is involved with the organization of work, um, are a result of actors' dissatisfaction with the status quo, including actors such as businesses or owners that want more profit. And will they try to or be able to use technology to uh, make more work that has been done remotely by employees during the pandemic, remote work that's being done by independent contractors or outsourcers? Yes, I think so. Um, will there be countervailing uh, powers in a particular situation that can halt that or stop that? I mean, the employment effects are, I think, mediated by the presence of unions and professional licensing. And these are the uh, government bodies and, and regulations that come in, perhaps in the big Build Back Better bill, uh, more fines for anti-union uh, activity and, and enforcement of those labor standards. But uh, it, it is... Um, uh, Certainly the case, that, as you say, that there's a big risk or technology has always created this potential to have work done from anywhere. And um, only in certain cir circumstances so far have firms been able to realize, I think, the potential advantages of that. Victoria, is there time for one short question? Uh, yeah, yeah, we still have a few minutes. Please go ahead. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm curious also, what do you think about the two long running trends beyond you know, the contract thing and the COVID related, uh, the changes we are going through. Uh, one of the old trends is the, with the, with the deployment information and communication to the technology, firms tend to be smaller in the sense that there are more transactions, but more of these transactions are taking place between firms within, within firms. So that with more technology, firms are getting smaller, which means that many of the labor are switching from relatively small size or organizations. Uh, on, on average. The other thing is uh, firms are using more and more uh, short-term contract people. They are not contracted, they are employees with the shorter contract. These are bigger consequences in Europe. Uh, uh, it happened, in, especially in France, after they switched to 35 hours. Well, many large firms uh, stop hiring people with you know, infinite contracts. They said that, okay, we are hiring for one year, two years. They keep renewing it, but of course they leave them for uh, you know, the long-term uh, benefits and other things and so on, you know, both, both, both in a way that shifting more of the work to smaller organizations and shifting more of the labor from the people with much more secure long-term jobs to shorter, shorter uh, contracts. They are still not contractors, they are employees. Uh, what do you think that in the light of the things that we learned uh, can be done to improve uh, and, you know, the position of the labor under these conditions, in addition to things that we already discussed. 
I would I would just say in one word, uh, co-ops. I, I think you know independent contractors banding together, and and that could be a legal co-op or it could be like uh, I know one thing we're seeing popping up in um, in New York is you know a a I think it's blockchain based, but either way, it's a driver owned app like Uber where you can order cars. And because once you get that software running, right, the proceeds from that can run a small software team uh, that can keep that app up. And so I think you're going to see these, the essentially these contractors organizing into co-ops or into, you know, informal or just non-legally protected unions, uh, et cetera, and, uh, and using that as a way to create some power and uh, leverage for themselves. Um, it is just getting started though. I have not seen a good example of that where it's really, uh, really made a huge difference. Any other last comments? We are actually exactly out of time now. And I believe all of these comments we can save and we will also save all of the materials and presentations that you have added. Thank you so much for attaching all of these. Um, and there's, I think, a couple of last minute questions if, if any of the speakers want to stay back and answer some of them on chat. But with this, I would like to close this webinar for today and thank our panelists who've done an amazing job and shared really, really interesting insights and the work that they're working on. Thank you for your time. And, and I hope that we can continue the discussion offline and in future webinars. And thank, thank you, Victoria, you for organizing as well. Thank and you. from all these days, thank you to Victoria for organizing this. Thank you very much. Very inspiring. And thank you to ODC and the UN for enabling this. Thanks a lot. <laughs>